This is Ask a Biologist, a program about the living world, and I'm Dr. Biology. For those who have been following along, we have been visiting the Phoenix Zoo for the past couple episodes. This will be the third in the series, and one where I hope we get to play around, or at least learn about play, and in particular, how, why, and when animals play. Because play is important for so many things, like skill development, physical fitness, stress relief, one of my favorites. It also promotes cognitive development by challenging learners to solve problems, make decisions, and think abstractly. And play is not just for humans. Primates, you know, apes and chimpanzees, birds, they've been known to play, cetaceans, which are dolphins and whales, all are known to play. There's even research on reptiles and insects that show some play-like behavior. I'm looking forward to the conversation today because our guest is Danielle Wong, the Behavioral Enrichment and Animal Welfare Coordinator at the Phoenix Zoo. If anyone knows about animal play and what it takes to make an engaging and I might even say fun environment for animals, it will be Danielle. And I bet we learn a lot more about what it takes to develop the best enrichment activities and environments for a wide range of animals. Welcome to Ask a Biologist, Danielle. Thank you for having me. It's been such a joy to be at the zoo, just to be able to get out and be with the animals. You know, that's not really a job, is it? Oh, no. When people think of a job, they think of something they have to go do. Going to the zoo every day is a treat. Right. And I started the episode off talking about play as part of animal enrichment. What else is involved with animal enrichment beyond play? When we talk about behavioral enrichment at the zoo, we're talking about purposeful, goal-oriented items, which can be to stimulate play and to have them spend their time doing something. But more than that, we like to tie into their natural history and we like to dive into what should they be doing, what behaviors should we be seeing, what aren't we seeing, and then we try to elicit those behaviors. Ah, interesting. So if a giraffe isn't acting like a giraffe, there's a problem. Yeah. When people think of animals in the zoo, they automatically think that they're domesticated in some way. But these animals are still wild. They still have all the natural instincts. And in order to promote their most optimal well-being, we want them to exhibit all their natural behaviors that they can and have that capacity to do that. And behavioral enrichment allows them to do that. Hmm. Okay. So I promised a little bit about play. (laughs) So... I do want to get into that part. One of the questions, though, before we dive into all the animals that you know that play at the zoo, are there animals that don't play? Do you know? I'm thinking probably not a snake. Well, you know, it really is going to depend on the individual within a species, too. So I'm sure that there probably are some instances of play being seen across all species, but when um, you take into consideration their age and the individual behavior as well, sometimes we don't see that as much. And so it really just depends. Okay. So for those that play, let's pick the most playful animal at the zoo now. Well, probably a huge favorite would be Chudy, the greater one horn rhino. He is one of the most engaging animals that we have, and he spends a lot of time interacting with his environment, interacting with his behavioral enrichment, and even interacting with his keepers. And a lot of that would come across as this aimless play behavior where he's just playing and he's moving around in his exhibit, and it's so much fun to watch. Right. When I look at him and he's in his habitat and enclosure, I notice what I would say are toys. So can we talk about some of the toys and how did someone come up with the idea that a tire is a good toy? Right. Those toys that we're talking about, that's the behavioral enrichment. 
And so probably the easiest way to relate it to us as humans is to think of it as toys. But if there's one thing we can take away from this, it's so much more than that. And so a lot of the items that he has in his exhibit, they're fun for him to interact with, but they do also serve a purpose. A lot of those items that he gets up and he manipulates, he throws them around, which he has been known to do. He'll get a drainage culvert, like a black pipe on his uh, horn, and he'll toss it in the air. He'll carry it around. All of that stuff helps tie into his natural history, where these guys are known to kind of be ecosystem engineers in a way. They go through their environment, and they will root through things. They will move things around, and that will actually help create different architecture in the ecosystem where they're from and so all of that while it seems like a lot of fun and it definitely is it really ties into their natural history too and where we get the ideas for things is somebody just randomly thought hey this might be really fun to play with or to provide for him and then go from there and a lot of that actually comes from the industry the zoo industry together will rely on one another for their expertise and their experiences in order to help provide the best experience for the animals very interesting because i don't usually think about animals as engineers but yes there are quite a bit of animals yeah. that are engineers besides the rhino what are we going to have for engineers at the zoo oh goodness well there are let's see some cape porcupines that will naturally dig into the ground in order to excavate burrows and or to find their food you've got birds as well that will kind of take items from one location to another nest building all of that so across the entire animal kingdom you're going to have engineers everywhere we might have to think about it a little bit more to think of it as engineering right what about the primates Oh, easily. Most primates are so intelligent, they can utilize tools. And so you can actually see a lot of that example in the environment that we provide to them. In their enclosures, they can move things around. We provide them tools to utilize for puzzle feeders. You'll just see their behavioral enrichment's really geared towards that tool use as well. Hmm. Now, in addition to behavioral enrichment, the other area that you're very interested in is well-being. We had Dr. Gary West on the last episode talking about life as a zoo veterinarian, right? Beyond their health care, you're looking, well, you're looking into the well-being of the animals just as much. You just aren't necessarily treating them for any kind of health issues. So what does that involve? Yeah. When we're talking about well-being, we're talking about the state of being comfortable, healthy, or happy, which ultimately is the question that everybody wants to know. Is that animal happy? And so that's what we're looking at. And what we'll actually do is our keepers know the animals the best. And the keepers on a daily basis are working with these animals and they might notice some subtle changes. And they record everything. They have those conversations if they're starting to see something. So that's always happening on a daily basis where these keepers are keeping an eye on the animals. But we do also have a more formal assessment process. And that's our well-being assessments. And for those, we will look at both the inputs or things that we provide to the animals. So We provide their diet, their enclosure space, their behavioral enrichment, the trained staff that work with them. But then we also look at their outputs, so what they're giving to us, their health, their weight, behaviorally, how they're responding to us. And we look at all of these assessments, and then we go through and see, well, how are we doing? Do we need to have areas of improvement, or do we have those areas, I should say, that we need to improve on? And then we go through and we can have those conversations and make those changes if needed. And that's kind of our way of keeping us in check, making sure that we are doing right by the animals, because that is definitely our top priority. But it is our way to keep us in check on that. And it's a whole process that the keepers get to fill it out. The managers come in, they provide their input. The curators provide their input. Then it comes to me and the director of living collections. We get to provide input. If there are any concerns, we have an animal welfare committee on board that we go through, we review, and then we make those changes as needed. You use the the term happy. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and uh, obviously that's a, a challenge, right, with animals yes. saying happy. So we might say content or even maybe better, just they're in their natural animal groove. Yes. And you talked about learning about the natural history of a particular animal. And that's the part I am interpreting that you basically do the research on how an animal should behave in the wild. And if they're not doing something similar in the zoo, then probably something's wrong. Right. And that's where leaning on our industry as well is so important because we've got decades and decades of experience of people working with these animals and saying, hey, that's not normal, or that's exactly what you'd want to see. And honestly, this whole field is just constantly progressing. We're learning more. We're always trying to improve. And so we talk about like animal welfare science. That's the science that we've used to inform our conversations about well-being. So there's always room for improvement in my mind, and so it's always looking for ways that we can do more. Right. On an earlier episode, we talked about one of the challenges with zoos, because there are some people that don't like zoos. Mm -hmm. And I do understand they, they really think of them more as prisons than a resort. They also don't always realize the conservation role that you play. When we talk about the animals and the idea is that we're not trying to domesticate them. That's one thing. Let them be wild. That's important. But the other one is some of the animals that you have at the zoo do get reintroduced into the wild. So when you're working with those kind of animals, what do you do that's, if anything, different than the ones you do that probably aren't going to be released into the wild? That's a super great question. Those animals that may be released into the wild definitely have more restrictions on how we typically work with them. A lot of those animals tend to be less human involvement, a little more hands-off. You try to not familiarize them with humans and or training them any sort of capacity because you don't want them to go out into the wild and then be habituated to go right back into a populated area. And so... For those animals, when we talk about like behavioral enrichment and things like that, we try to keep it as natural as possible. So we're definitely more limited there. But it also is geared towards seeing those skills that we would want to see prior to them being released. And I think that's what's really important to know is that it's all, again, still very goal-oriented and purposeful ties right back into that but for them the intent and the purpose is just a little different so that's how we offer them just some slightly different things right now when you're building your habitat and you're thinking about them and if i'm not mistaken though what is it is it the squirrel monkeys is it the new the new home for them in the monkey village yeah monkey village was monkey village basically renovated before we got our new troop of monkeys for Monkey Village. Mm-hmm. Did we renovate the space beforehand? We actually did make some modifications, namely extending wall height and trimming back limbs on trees because we wouldn't want them to accidentally find their way out of the exhibit. And oftentimes it wouldn't be necessarily their intent to find their way out of the exhibit. They would just happen to find their way out through a pathway and then they would be out there The other animals would be inside and they would be kind of confused, like, oh, how do I get back in there? So in order to kind of prevent that confusion on their part, and also it's a new space for them, so really just kind of defining the boundaries of the space for them, making those modifications on trimming back those limbs, increasing the height. We closed down Monkey Village so that they would have time to acclimate to the space themselves. So it wasn't even open to the public for people to go in. That way they had time to get used to their environment. And then as we started to introduce people back in, because it is a walkthrough exhibit, when we introduced people back in, we started by having the people only go a certain distance or smaller groups, just slowly getting them used to having people in their space. But they have all sorts of space in there to get away if they want to they can regulate their distance and they really seem to be enjoying their exhibit and they're really fun to watch in there too right 
that's one of the favorite places for me to go. <laughs> uh, and the bird aviary. You, know, you have several of them that are quite nice where you can go in and the birds are just wandering around, flying from place to place. That's another place. So when you're developing a new habitat, how do you do that? And part of that question also is, how long does that take to figure out? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it takes a long time. And it really just depends on how big of a scale we're talking, on how long it takes to go from start to finish. But we really do try to design the exhibits with the animal's natural history in mind. You want to ensure that there's enough, one, space for them. And so... When we look at a space that we could be doing an exhibit, we go through and we say, well, how much space do we have? Realistically, what animals can go there? And then we sit there and we then think, well, what are their requirements? What do they need? What do they need for resting? What do they need for locomotion, moving around? Also, a lot of animals will come in social groups. A lot of animals are social. And so what are their requirements there? And if it is a social group, well, then the space needs to be bigger to be able to have them regulate their space from individuals of their species or their social companions, as you will. And so there's a lot of thought on that end. But then furthermore, you then go and look at their natural history. If you build an exhibit for a jaguar, for example, you also want to include not just a lot of space on the ground, but a lot of vertical space because they are an arboreal cat. They'll go up into the trees and they climb. And so you really have to tie all of that in. So it's a big design process. Of course, we always want to make sure that the space that we provide for them is optimal for their well-being. But we also want to make sure that the guests can really see what space they're in, too. And so it takes a while to design, and then once you have a design, then it goes into the construction phase. And like all construction projects, sometimes that gets pushed back. But it's definitely worth the wait once you have those new exhibits open and you have those animals out there and you're seeing how they're in those exhibits and behaviorally how they're responding to their new space. You know what I'm waiting for? Predator passage. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I think, what, the meerkats, aren't they going to be in there? We're going to have meerkats, hyenas, then we're going to have a leopard as well as African lions. Wow. I know. It's going to be amazing once it opens. And we delayed the opening. And why? Well, sometimes construction projects might take a little longer, but also we have to think about where we are. We're in Phoenix. It is so warm here during the summer that... When we talk about bringing in animals for these new exhibits or transfers, we also have to consider what is the weather like and is this the optimal time to bring them in? And for a good part of our year, the answer is no, it is way too warm. And so we do have to wait for that perfect window for them to come in when it's a little cooler so that they can adjust to not only the new space, but also the weather. Mm. All right, I got to get back to play again. Okay. <laughs> because... I would like to know if you have at least one, and you might have more than one, so you can pick one or two favorite experiences with the animals really looking like they're enjoying what they're doing and something that maybe surprised you. You know, this to me is probably one of the funniest things I've ever gotten to witness, but we offer a lot of our animals foraging devices. And by foraging devices, I mean items that will extend the amount of time that they take to consume their food. And by that, it might take long for them to get it, and then they have to chew it, eat it, process it. And so these foraging devices are probably the most common behavioral enrichment that you'll see, and they can come in all shapes and sizes, all different materials, and they can be for the smallest of animals to the largest of animals. And there are some devices that are specifically made for animals, like for foraging like this. So people at home could use them for their pets too. And we have in our Harmony Farms in our children's zoo area, we have three equine. They are Strawberry, the miniature horse. We have Dinky, the miniature donkey, and Popeye, the mule. And these guys, they were all given the same enrichment item, a pellet ball. And it has a hole 
in it so that the keepers can put their pelleted diet in it. And then they have to figure out, well, how do I get the pellets out? And then I get to eat it. And every single one of them, they're lined up right next to each other on their exhibit. Every single one of them used a different method. And I thought that was the most intriguing thing to watch. And any person that would come by, all the guests, I would excitedly tell them, watch them, watch how they do it. So it was really funny because Strawberry would knock it around and would seem to get the most exercise from this. She would knock it around and then she would follow it and she would go all over trying to get the pellets out of this ball. Dinky was a little more reserved, would knock it around, but would not go as far, wouldn't knock it as hard, and still would get all the pellets out of it. But then you had Popeye, and Popeye would just put his nose on the end of it, and he would shake it back and forth with his head, so he wasn't moving an inch, but he was getting all the pellets out of it. And I think that is just the funniest example of how behavioral enrichment, it serves a goal, Every animal is going to problem solve differently. Every animal is going to utilize it differently. And so they surprise us how they use them. Is there a, an animal that solved a problem that you were a little bit surprised and maybe solved a problem that you didn't want them to solve? Yes, definitely. Probably happens way more than I'd like to admit. But let's see. Not too long ago, I thought, well, how can we use cardboard boxes differently? Cardboard boxes are probably one of the most common items that we can give our animals because we always have cardboard boxes. Our staff can bring them in and we can use them in a variety of ways. But I thought, you know, how can I make this cardboard box a little more challenging? So I decided to put some obstacles or blockers in it. The keepers would put the food in it so it wouldn't just fall right out. And then I decided to essentially paper mache the outside of it closed so they couldn't just open the box. There was a hole on top so they'd have to kind of juggle it around. And I gave that to our orangutan keepers to give to our orangutans. And Huagasa, one of our males, decided, I'm not going to lift this up and try and get the food items out of the hole. I'm just going to rip off the paper mache and then I'm going to open it that way. And I walked away from that feeling defeated, but you know what? It's still achieved the goal of extending the amount of time it took him to eat his food and he definitely problem solved he just problem solved in a way i didn't expect yeah very quick when we talk about well-being we talk about play and these are all going to come together it's about exercise Mm -hmm. so one of the things i'd like to know is how do you develop these activities that make sure that an animal is getting the right amount of exercise so that they can keep their health up? A lot of it relies on experience that the keepers have. Well, you know, I've done this at a different zoo with this animal. Maybe this can work with this animal. It takes a lot about their natural history. Well, how would they naturally move through their environment? How can we encourage that? It also takes into account safety. Safety is really important as well. You can put a ball in an exhibit and get an animal to move that ball around. Predators or things like a tiger would be probably the best example of that because a ball could stimulate their prey drive where they see that movement and they want to chase it. But what if the exhibit has a slope in it? And what if that ball runs down and happens to hit the fence or hit the glass? So you do have to consider safety as well. And so a lot of that just relies on the experience of the keepers, the managers, the vet staff to ensure that the activity chosen is going to play into their natural history, their intended goal and their needs, but also be done in an appropriate and safe manner. So how do you know if an animal's in shape? That's a great question. So our keepers, they form these great relationships with the animals and In general, there are several categories of behavioral enrichment, one of them being social, and social enrichment can include interacting with humans, so we do that through training. And so the keepers are able to train their animals to go on a scale, get their weight, but then also it's not just about the number on the scale, it's also about how they look. And so that's where we rely on the vet staff and their expertise and their knowledge to come in and get a good look at the animal and say, well, they're at a decent weight, but maybe their body condition is not where we need it to be. Maybe they need to gain more weight. Maybe they need to lose a little weight. They do definitely get all the food they could possibly want, 
but we like to make sure that they're still healthy. So we look at their weight, we look at their body condition, and then they'll make adjustments from there as needed. And that might include diet decreases, that might include more exercise, providing enrichment that will help increase their exercise and movement. And that's not just for their weight as well, that's also can be for their joint health, things like that. So it really is tailored to the individual. It's the same thing that we have to do as we get older. We need to make sure that we uh, continue to exercise for our joints, for mm-hmm. our bone strength, for our muscles. Mm-hmm. After, I'd say, roughly 40 years of age, for humans, you start to lose muscle mass. If you don't use it, you are going to lose it. Mm-hmm. Well, on Ask a Biologist, before my guests can leave, I always ask three questions. All right? So are you ready? I'm ready. All right. When did you first know you wanted to work at a zoo? I would say probably when I was young. I was probably around 10, 11 years old. And I actually went to SeaWorld, and I was inspired from my experience there. And it wasn't the experience of seeing the shows or seeing all of the animals. My experience was at the end of the night, on the way out of the park, we're heading to our car. We just decided to make one last stop over near where the orca whales were. And just so happened that one of the trainers was out there talking to this animal. Wasn't really interacting with their animal in any formal capacity, just talking. And you can really see that bond. And that trainer spent time talking to me all about them, you know, their natural history and this individual, what they like. And from there on, I was so inspired on how a person could have that great of a relationship with an animal. And from there, I just knew I wanted to work with animals. And it probably wasn't until I was in college that I just happened to start volunteering at an aquarium in their husbandry department, taking care of their animals, that I realized this is exactly where I want to be in a zoo or an aquarium doing this job. Hmm. So what's your degree in? I have a degree in organismal biology. It used to be zoology, but it got combined with botany and ecology. So overall, organismal biology. And that's what I studied all throughout college and volunteered at the same time. And it was a lot of fun. Okay. Now, I'm always a little bit mean on the second question because... (laughs) We learn how you got to where you want to be, and almost every guest, I, I, haven't, I don't think I've ever had a guest that didn't love what they do. Yeah. Which is great. But I'm going to take it all away for this thought experiment. You're not going to be able to be at a zoo at all. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to take away probably teaching, because there's a lot of teaching in, your, in what you do. Mm-hmm. What would you be or what would you do if you could do anything? definitely would still be in the realm of science. I'm a science person. I think that what has always fascinated me and where I've lived, I've always been fascinated by them is storms. For some reason, I don't know why, storms are very interesting to me. They make me feel very humble (laughs) about where I live. And so I think I would want to do something related to weather probably not to go as far as storm chasing, but I think that would be really fun and interesting to learn about. Well, you talk about unpredictable animals, but storms are about as unpredictable as it gets, right? Exactly. Wow. Hmm. Yeah, I was just going to say, you're going to be a storm chaser, but you're going to go a little bit short of being a storm chaser. Probably. I I don't know if I have the gut for that or something. (laughs) I'm with you. I think I'll watch it from afar. (laughs) So... The last question, because we get a lot of questions from young and old, or older people, I should say, that really love animals and actually would like to work at a zoo. What advice would you have for someone who wants to have your job? Yeah, I started out as a zookeeper, and I think to get into where I'm at now, which I absolutely love my job. I think that you'd have to start out with having that hands-on experience of working with the animals and truly understanding them and their behavior and how you work with them. In order to become a zookeeper, though, 
you definitely need to have both the education. So you'd want to go to school, you'd want to study something like biology, zoology, or even psychology, because again, behavior is a huge part of it. And then from there, it's getting hands-on experience. So for me, I started volunteering while I was in college, and I did that on Fridays, and I went to class Monday through Thursday. And from there, I did internships, so I would take the summer to try and go get more experience with different animals. And that hands-on experience is the most valuable thing that you can have. The education helps fuel your understanding, but the hands-on experience is really the know-how. And so that's the best way to get into the zoo field, to become a zookeeper. And from there, I guess the best piece of advice for anybody is when you want to get into the zoo field, be open to the animals you want to work with because there's not always going to be jobs with the very specific animals that you think you want to work with. And so be open to everything because they might surprise you. Right. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. You know, someone <laughs> might say, I only want to work with the rhinos. Right. That sounded so much fun. But you actually started out, if I'm not mistaken, as uh, someone who worked with uh, – Cats, the big cats, right? So my first experience was in a children's zoo with more domestic animals, goats and sheep and chickens, things like that. And then I did actually quickly move over into a carnivore department working with tigers and lions and cheetahs. And I definitely think carnivores are my love, specifically otters. Otters are a huge favorite of mine. But had I not done the other experience I wouldn't have gotten to learn about other animals and experience other things and I'm really surprised by how much I enjoyed working with some of the other species that I've gotten to work with. Until you actually live and work with them you really don't know them do you? Exactly. Well Danielle thank you so much for taking time out from your great group of animals that uh, you could spend some time with us. Yeah thank you so much for having me. You have been listening to Ask a Biologist, and my guest has been Danielle Wong, the Behavioral Enrichment and Animal Welfare Coordinator at the Phoenix Zoo. Now, like most of our podcasts, we will be sure to add links and additional information in the show notes, so be sure to check those out. The Ask a Biologist podcast is produced on the campus of Arizona State University and is recorded in the Grassroots Studio housed in the School of Life Sciences, which is an academic unit of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Obviously, we're not there today. We're actually at the Phoenix Zoo, but that's where we usually do the recordings. And remember, even though our program is not broadcast live, you can still send us your questions about biology using our companion website. The address is askabiologist.asu.edu. Or you can just use one of your favorite search tools and enter the words, Ask a Biologist. As always, I'm Dr. Biology, and I hope you're staying safe and healthy.